Hey there guys, Quirk here from MiniWarGaming.com. I'm about to give you an awesome Harlequins Codex review. Now before we get into this, I'm going to give you a warning. There are a few spoilers, because in the vault, I have an awesome battle with a guest named Ken, where he and I are going to be throwing down, and I'm going to be using the new Harlequins. So I would definitely recommend, if you are not a vault member, clicking that link below after watching this review, seeing that battle report, and getting a good first impression of how the Harlequins actually play with all of their new stratagems, relics, masks, and things like that. So if you're not a vault member, click that link below, check out that awesome battle report. And without further ado, let's get into this review. We play and call it work. Uh, uh. Mini War Gaming's Warhammer 40k Battle Reports! Hey there guys, Quirk here from MiniWarGaming.com to give you a wonderful review on the new Harlequins Codex. I'm super excited because as most of you know if you watch any of my battle reports, I am a huge fan of the Harlequins. I like running them as an army and I am super de duper over the moon excited that they are getting their own codex. That they've gotten their own codex and I've got three games under my belt and I can tell you they are so much better now. So. Uh, what we're going to do for this review is I have a battle report uh, linked with it as well, so you can watch the battle report, you can watch this, and you can watch that, and then after this, um, on Monday, so this is going to be going out, well, I believe it's Saturday that you're going to be seeing this video, uh, the following Monday we have actually got two more battle reports with the Harlequins for you guys, so um, I am going to be referring to a number of those battle reports when I'm talking about stuff from this book, so just to let you know, there might be a little bit of spoilers for those battle reports, but at the same point in time you can go ahead and check out those videos to watch all the stuff from this book. In action. So, uh, for the review, I'm going to be going through it. I have the old index here with all the stuff that they had beforehand. I'm going to be giving you guys comparisons as to what's been changed in the new book. And I'm also going to be going over just all the new um, relics, the stratagems, and the masks that they've got available to them as of now, as of late. So, um, what the masks basically do is they kind of fill in as keywords for the Harlequin. So, as you've seen with other chapters and books, and they have their seps, their chapters, their um, dynasties, things like that. The Harlequins actually did get access to that. They've got six of them, and they're awesome. So, first off, uh, the, you got quite a good chunk of lore, actually. This good half, if not more, of the book is lore, talking about all the different uh, units in the book, so they do a really good job of that. But the first thing they cover here is that how the masks work, which is essentially how I just explained it. They go through and say, you know, fill in where it shows a little bracket, say mask, you can put in any one of the six that are available and the units in the detachment that are under that mask get the benefits for running that. Uh, that. So, <clears throat> let's jump right into it here. Starting off, we've got the Troop Master. Now again, I'm going to keep point totals out of this just because I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say them or not, and if I'm not, I'd rather be safe than sorry, but I will tell you all the crazy abilities that they do get as I move all the terrain all over this board, because I did just finish a game and I wanted to get this review out what was fresh in my mind. So, uh, first things first, we've got the Troop Master. So let me jump over to the Troop Master and the Index. Boom, there you are. Uh, same, po pardon me, pardon <laughs> same power level. Um, the stats are remaining completely identical. So there's still Movement 8, Weapon Skill Blitz Skill 2+, plus, Strength and Toughness 3, 5 Wounds, 5 Attacks, Leadership 9, and a 6-up save. They have access to the Fusion Pistol, Nero Disruptor, Shuriken Pistol, Hogman's Blade, Caress, Embrace, Kiss, Power Sword, and a Plasma Grenade. So, um, for the most part, the... Only real change to the actual loadouts that, uh, weapons-wise, that have been altered a little bit. The Nero Disruptor has gone from Strength 3 to Strength 4, so it got a little bit of a boost there, which is kind of sweet. And then what they've also done is they've changed it, so, changed it so that all of the Caress, Embrace, and Kiss no longer say Strength 5, 4, or 4, whatever. They actually go plus 2, plus 1, plus 1. So that's kind of neat right there. Uh, otherwise, the stats have remained exactly the same. The power source still works the same. The plasma grenade still works the same. So if you do have access to the index or you've played Harlequins before, you know kind of what you're dealing with there. And again, the points kind of switch back and forth. I can tell you this much though, the points for pretty much everything have dropped. So you can bring so much more in your army. It's awesome. Now, the entire Harlequin army does have access to the ability called Rising Crescendo, which works the same way as it did in the index, but this model can advance and charge in the same turn. In addition, it can fall back and still shoot and or charge in the same turn, which is kind of cool right there. Um, it still gives you limitations that you can't charge and fire, or sorry, advance and fire your pistols, um, but otherwise you're kind of set right there, which is cool. Uh, they do have access to the flip belts. Again, this is something that all the infantry, pretty much anything that's not a... Uh, transport, Void Weaver, or Star Weaver, Sky Weaver, all of them have access to, where this model can move across models and terrain as if they were not there, which is kind of sweet. 
Troopmaster has a hollow suit. This model has a four up and vulnerable save. Again, that's something that everything in this book has. So everything has the hollow suit or mirage launcher, giving it a four up and vulnerable save. The Troopmaster also has access to an ability called Cartographer of War, where in the fight phase, reroll failed wound rolls for friendly mask units that are within six inches of this model. So again, you kind of kind of have to keep an eye on your masks when you're doing that, but otherwise it's still really cool right there. Moving on from the Troop Master, we have the second HQ choice in this book, and that is the Shadow Seer. Again, the Shadow Seer's stats have remained exactly the same, where it is 8-inch eight, eight movement, 2 plus 2 plus weapon skill, bullet skill, strength and toughness 3, 5 wounds, 3 attacks, leadership 9, and a 7 plus save. So the Shadow Seer is going to be heavily relying on that hollow suit for up and vulnerable save. Uh, the Shadow Seer also has access to the uh, hallucinogen grenade launcher where it's a 18 inch assault one if you hit all you got to do is roll equal to or higher than the unit's leadership and you inflict d3 mortal wounds which is kind of cool right there uh, also has rising crescendo and flip belt as well as the hollow suit also has access to an ability called shield from harm where your opponent must subtract one from wound rolls for any attacks that target friendly mask infantry units that are within six inches of any model with this ability so it's also a nice little trick right there um, the Shadow Seer is the only Psyker in this book. You can attempt to manifest two powers in each friendly phase. Whoa, hang on. Oh, I've been messing that up. Hmm, I thought it was only one. This model can attempt to cast a two. Yeah, it's the same as before. I don't know why I messed that up. Two powers in each friendly Psychic phase and attempt to deny one power in each friendly, in each enemy Psychic phase. He knows Smite and two Psychic powers from the Phantasmancy Discipline. Now, before I continue on the infantry and everything like that, let's go ahead and talk about the powers from the Phantasmancy Discipline because they've got access to a few more. So, the ones that we know already are things like Twilight Pathways. That is exactly the same way it is in the book, where on a casting value of six, a friendly Harlequin unit within three inches of the Psyker and visible to it can immediately move as if it were the movement phase. Um, you can't use this power more than, or sorry, you can't use this power on a unit more than once in each psychic phase. So if you're using like open or narrative play, you can't keep Twilight Path through the same unit across the board. You've also got access to Fogs, Fog of Dreams, which we know from before is a casting value of um, six. So it actually went down from the index where it was a casting value of seven. And if you do it, your opponent must subtract, uh, sorry, uh, you, sorry. <coughs> Select an enemy unit within 18 inches of the Psyker and visible to it until the next psychic until your next psychic phase, your opponent must subtract one from hit rolls for any unit that is a Harlequin infantry unit. So that's kind of cool right there. You also have Mirror of Minds, which went down in value. So Mirror of Minds in the index was a casting value of eight. It's now a casting value of seven. And select an enemy unit within 24 inches of the Psyker. Then both players roll a D6. If the Harlequin player's roll is equal to or higher than the opponent's, then the target unit suffers one mortal wound. Repeat this process until the target is destroyed or the enemy player rolls a result that is higher than the Harlequin player's roll. That's kind of cool right there. Those are the three that we know already, and these are the only power, sorry, the uh, Shadow Seer is the only one who's able to use them. Now we've got four, or sorry, three new powers. The first one is Veil of Tears, where on a casting value of seven, uh, you select a friendly Harlequin infantry unit within 18 inches of the Psyker. Until the start of the next Psychic phase, subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that ma are made against this unit. So you can actually kind of double up on both of those if you Fog of Dreams a unit and then Veil of Tears a unit and they try and shoot at that unit or get into close combat, you're minus two to hit, which is kind of cool. You also have access to Shards of Light. Shards of Light has a casting value of seven. If manifested, select an enemy unit within 18 of the Psyker and visible to it. That unit suffers D3 mortal wounds and must subtract one from its leadership characteristic until the start of your next Psychic phase. That's pretty sweet. Well, lastly, we have Webway Dance. Now. This is kind of an interesting one, it helps you be a little bit more survivable, where on a casting value of 7, uh, until the next Psychic phase, roll a d6 whenever a friendly Harlequin unit within 6 inches of the Psyker loses a wound, on a 6 that wound is not lost. So it's a nice little bubble of uh, feel no pain. So that's it for the Shadow Seer, those are your two HQ choices, let's jump on over to the troops. Now the troops as a whole, um, again I'm not giving you the specifics, but they have dropped in points, which is kind of nice right there. They still maintain the same profile of 8 inch move, 3 plus, 3 plus, weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength and toughness 3, 1 wound, 4 attacks, leadership 8, and a save of 6 plus. They have a flip belt, hollow suit, and rising crescendo ability, so they have everything I've already mentioned before. And they have access to all the weapons they had before, so you're looking at the fusion pistol, neuro disruptor, shuriken pistol, harlequins, blade, caress, kiss, and um, plasma grenades. So, it's kind of cool right there. Um, they do have the mask ability, so you can actually start using some of the abilities that are available later on that I'm going to cover. Now let's move on to some of the elite choices. We have the Death Jester. Now, you've probably heard me say this a couple times. 
that the Death Jester is the worst sniper in the game. I will officially be taking back that statement. The Death Jester is probably the best sniper in the game, and if you've watched the Battle Report before reading this, re seeing this review, you understand why. So, the Death Jester has the exact same profile it had before. None of the, I don't think any of the profiles actually really changed that much, but it's 8-inch move, 2 plus 2 plus weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength and toughness 3, 5 wounds, 4 attacks, leadership 9, and a 6-up save, has the Rising Crescendo Hollow Suit Flip Belt, also has the Deadly Hunter ability where it can target characters even if it's not the closest unit, as well as Death is Not Enough, where if any model f flee from a unit in which the same turn that they were attacked by this model, uh, I, the player who has the Death Jester can actually choose which is the first model to flee instead of your opponents. You can actually force your opponent to pull sergeants out of squads, um, pull, pull special characters, things that are giving buffs. It works really good against demons if they actually fail a morale to pull out the banner so that you don't get that one getting more guys back, which is kind of cool. And you have access to the Shrieker Cannon. The Shrieker Cannon, the only change for this is that in the Shrieker mode, where it's a 24 inch range, Assault 1, Strength 6, it used to be AP nothing, now it's AP minus 1. One damage, and each time, an infantry, ugh, each time an infantry model is slain by an attack made with this weapon, the unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. If any, pardon me, if any models in the unit are slain by this weapon, subtract two from the leadership characteristic until the end of the turn. And then you've got the other profile where it's uh, three shots, strength six, AP nothing, one damage, no special rules. Now, I'm saying he's the best sniper. There are reasons for that. Compared to what he was before, it's like, okay, well, he got minus one to his shot. That's not that good. Wait till I get to the relics and the stratagems, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Moving on from the Death Gesture, we have the Solitaire. Nothing has changed from the Solitaire in the book to the Solitaire that we have now. Still has the um, Impossible Form, Flip Belt, Blitz, Rising Crescendo. The only real change to this one is that they made it so that the Solitaire can never have a Warlord trait, which they didn't have in here, but that didn't really matter too, too much because he didn't really have Warlord traits available to you. And I actually think it said somewhere in here that the Solitaire can't take Warlord traits, but they actually made a point of saying they can't take the Warlord trait. Only change. Going on from the Solitaire, we've got the Skyweavers. Those are the jet bikes. In the book, compared to the Index, again, nothing has changed. The, oh, whoop, I'm looking at the wrong one. Still, nothing has changed. No, yes, something did change. Ha ha, I knew there was something in here. Um, the... Yeah, okay, I didn't mess that up. Look at this. Wait a second, something did change. No, okay. Uh, the only difference that we have here between the uh, Skyweavers in the Index and the Skyweavers here, first off, the power level dropped by one, so now the power level four instead of five. Uh, the Haywire Cannon went from being a 24 inch range heavy D3 to a 24 inch range Assault D6, which is kind of awesome right there. Still does the same thing where if you target a vehicle, you roll a four plus with the weapon, it takes a mortal wound. If you roll a six plus, it suffers D3 mortal wounds. Otherwise, the Shuriken Cannon is still the same, the Zephyr Glaive is still the same, and the Star Bolas are an extra damage, actually. They went from being Grenade D3 to, or sorry, Grenade D3, Strength 6, AP minus 3, 1 damage, to Grenade D3, Strength 6, minus 3, 2 damage. So that's kind of cool right there. Still have Rising Crescendo, Hollow Suits for the 4-up save, Mirage Launchers for the minus 1 against shooting attacks, and Blur of Color where they automatically advance 6 inches. So... Kind of neat right there. Hwa, moving along. The Void Weaver, again, the exact same as it was before, except the Haywire Cannon went from being Heavy D3 to Assault D6, just like it did before. And otherwise, nope. Still the same. Exactly the same. Points might have been changed a little bit, but that's where I'm leaving it. We've got the Star Weaver. So the Star Weaver has open top like it had before. It's still a 16-inch move, 3 plus, 3 plus, weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength and toughness 5, 6 wounds, 3 attacks, leadership 8, 4-up save, with a 4-up and vulnerable save thanks to the hollow field. Has the Mirage Launcher for a minus 1. It can still explode and still automatically advances 6 inches. So, But that's it for all the Harlequin stuff. Let's move on. Oh, wait. There's one more thing. We now have access to something called the Webway Gate. This is something I'm sure a lot of you guys have been looking forward to. That is the giant arching terrain piece that everybody's been seeing and wondering. I wonder how that works. So let's talk about it. First off, a Webway Gate is a single model formed of two separate pieces. When setting up these pieces, place them so that an arc is formed with the bases five inches apart. So. That being said, there's no way of finagling it. So like, say these are the two arches, you can't be like, okay, well, I'm gonna go like this, and this is the area that they cover, or I'm gonna put, I want, really want this to fit, so I'm gonna have them kind of sit like an arc like this and just 
this tiny little area is going to be it. No, it forces you to play deploy it a specific way. Trust me, I thought about that. I was like, oh, how can I game this? Nope, they did make sure you can't. Uh, Shimmering Revival. When you set up this, mo or sorry, when you set up this model during deployment, it can be set up anywhere on the battlefield, more than 12 inches away from enemy deployment zone and an enemy model, and more than three inches away from any other terrain feature or the center of an objective marker. It has an Eldritch Aura, giving it a four, or pardon me, a three plus invulnerable save. It is immobile, which means it cannot move for any reason, nor can it fight in the fight phase. Enemy models automatically hit this model in the fight phase. Do not make hit rolls. However, friendly units can still target enemy units within one inch of this model, which is kind of cool. Uh, the stat line for it, really quick, it's toughness 8, it's got 14 wounds and a 3-up save. Now, this is the really cool thing that we have here. We have Webway Strike. So after you set up this model, any Eldari mo or sorry, Eldari unit I don't know, uh, you have not set up during deployment other than fortifications can be set up in the Webway Spire rather than being set up on the battlefield. One unit in the Webway Spire can emerge each Sorry, from each friendly webway gate at the end of each of your movement phases. Set up wholly within three inches of the webway gate and more than nine inches away from any enemy models. If all friendly webway gates have been destroyed, any units that have not arrived from the webway spire are considered to be slain. So that's kind of a little risky there. Uh, else has webway gate when measuring distance to and from a webway gate, measure from the closest point of the model. If the webway gate is destroyed, remove both art pieces from the battlefield. Keywords, it has Eldari, and it also has a vehicle, building, and webway gate. So it, there's nothing specific about it. It's just, it's an Eldar, Eldari thing that you can use. So it's kind of neat right there. So that's it for all the new units. Let's get into the fun stuff here. We've got the masks. Now this is where it gets so good, and you can start building some amazing combos. First off, uh, the Wayfires of the Labyrinth, it gives them, a, it basically gives all of your Harlequins an ability if they are a full... Battle Forged Harlequin Army, Defenders of the Black Library, they essentially get objectives secured. So it's all your troop units in the Harlequin Detachments gain the ability where they can objective secured. Now let's talk about the masks. So um, if your army is Battle Forged, all units from a Harlequin Detachment gain a mask form, so long as every unit in the detachment from the same mask. So every detachment, you pick a mask and everybody in it gets this ability. So the first one we have here is Midnight Sorrow, the Art of Death. Units in this form can move an additional D6 when they fall back. In addition, units with this form can consolidate up to 6 inches. <sighs> That's really good, because it says when you're falling back, you um, Harlequins still have the Rising Crescendo ability so that you can fall back, still shoot and charge if you want to, but now that you're able to fall back an additional D6 on top of the 8 inches you move, it's essentially like getting a advance when falling back, which you can't do. So. Now you're able to fall back, go even further, can give you those objectives, can get you further into your opponent's lines if you wanted to. It's just more movement for the Harlequin. So that's a very, very fast option that's available to everybody. The next one that we have is Veiled Path, Riddlesmiths. At the start of each fight phase, roll two dice and discard the highest result. Until the end of the phase, each time your opponent targets a unit uh, with this form and makes a hit roll that, before modifiers, exactly matches your dice result, that hit roll fails. Now we've seen something similar to this before. This is actually a Loki that's available. Sorry, Loki that's available to Zinch Demons, where they have the exact same ability. Now it's kind of cool that Harlequins are going to get it because they're going to be able to run up into combat, roll two dice, and just start messing with people's ability to hit. Not something you want to rely on, but still a neat little gimmick that you can throw out every now and then. Next up, we have the Frozen Stars Hysterical Fury. If a unit from this form charges in the charge phase, add one to their attack characteristic until the end of the ensuing, ensuing fight phase. Very similar to 7th Edition charges, where if you charge and you get an extra attack, they've kind of brought that back with the stratagem a little bit, so that's kind of cool. Soaring Spite, Serpent's Brood. This is my favorite one. Models with this form that can fly or that are embarked upon a transport that can fly, treat all pistol weapons that they are equipped with as Assault 1 during the turn in which they, or the transport they are embarked upon, advanced. In addition, these models do not suffer the penalty to their hit rolls for shooting assault weapons in a turn in which they advanced. Hello. So let me explain this one for a little bit more if, that, uh, if you're like, okay, well that's kind of cool, I don't really get it. That means that you can take your transports that move 16, automatically advancing 6 inches for 22, put 5 fusion in there, and now you've got a 28 inch threat range with fusion pistols that don't suffer a modifier to hit. 
It also means that your bikes are now able to go 22 inches as their base movement, basically, and still fire their assault weapons without taking any modifiers. That's really, really good. Really good! Oh, as you've seen in some of my battle reports, I love running the, uh, the fusion pistol units, so I feel like this one was kind of designed just for me, so thanks Games Workshop, I appreciate you. Next up we have Dreaming Shadow, Somber Sentinels. When a unit in this form fails a morale check, only one model from the unit must flee. In addition, each time a model with this form is slain or flees, roll a d6 before removing the model. On a 4+, plus, that model can either shoot with one of its ranged weapons, as if it were the shooting phase, or make a single attack as if it were the fight phase. That's really good. Now this is one that I actually keep forgetting about because I've been taking the Dreaming Sorrow because it has access to uh, certain relics that I will explain in a minute. But it's actually a really cool trick because if you start giving that to things like your Death Jesters, your Shadow Seers, your Solitaires, that means that the Solitaire is going to be able to throw a punch in really quick if, you, if he's in combat. It means your solid, or sorry, your Shadow Seers and your Death Jesters are going to be able to fire again. Um, the Shadow Seer is going to be able to fire that grenade launcher, which is really, really cool. Sorry about that, little technical difficulties there. So yeah, what I was saying with the Dreaming Shadows is that the fact that you're able to get the 4 plus, able to do another attack or fire a shooting weapon, can definitely come in handy, especially if you start putting that on your characters or a couple things that can hit really hard. Or if you were able to put it on a, uh, like a troop squad, have them attack again, put them on a fusion squad, let them shoot again while they're in close combat because they are pistols, you can definitely do that. So a lot of really cool stuff right there. Then we have the last one here, the Silent Sh... Uh, Silent Shroud, sorry. A dance of nightmares made flesh. Subtract one from the leadership characteristic of enemy units while this they are within one inch of any unit from your army with this form. In addition, whenever your opponent makes a morale test uh, for a unit that's within six inches of any unit from this army, they must roll two dice and discard the lowest result. That's really cool when you start seeing a lot of the stuff that's able to modify the leadership. For starters, you've already got this one modifying the leadership. You've got the Death Dexter's Shot that can modify leadership. You've got the spell from the Shadow Seer that can modify leadership. You can stack a couple of those on, then make your opponent roll two dice and take the highest result. Definitely a good way to start losing guys to morale, which is kind of cool. So, that's it for the mask forms. Let's get into the stratagems. So one that I haven't used and I keep looking at it going, oh, I should really use this, but I always forget to, is the first one here. For two command points, Great Harlequin. Use a stratagem before the battle. Select a troop master from your army. That unit gains the Great Harlequin keyword and the following ability, Will of the Laughing God. In the fight phase, reroll hit rolls of one for friendly mask units while they were in six inches of while they are within six inches of this model. You can only use this stratagem once per battle. So that's kind of cool because the mask already sorry the troop master already gives an aura of six inches that lets you reroll failed wounds. Now you're able to reroll ones and failed wounds, which is really really cool for them. You've got a couple typical ones that we've seen before. Uh, Enigma of the Black Library for one command point or three command points. You can take an additional relic or two additional relics. Um, and then the Webway Assault for one command point or three command points. We've seen that one in the chapter approved. It's just you can take a Harlequin Infantry or Bike Unit and put them essentially in Deep Strike, which is kind of cool. Uh, we've also got the Prismatic Blur, which we've seen before, where for one command point, use this stratagem after a Harlequin unit from your army has advanced. That unit has a three-up and vulnerable save until the start of your next turn. That's really cool. Now we start getting into some of the ones that are a little bit uh, familiar, but not. For example, we've got the Hero's Path. Now this used to be a formation in 7th edition, but in 8th edition it's a stratagem for two command points. Use the stratagem at the start of your movement phase in which a Death Jester, a Solitaire, and a Shadow Seer from your army are within six inches of each other. Remove all three models from the battlefield, and at the end of that movement phase, you can set up each model anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine inches away from enemy units. That's really cool because I've done it actually in a couple of battle reports that you'll see. Um, I've taken them, stuck them in a corner where I know they'll be safe, and then when it, I need to, it only costs me two command points, and I can put all three of them wherever I need to, which is awesome. It saves you some command points and gives you those later on game uh, objective grabbers or putting your solitaire, or death jester, shallow, shadow seer wherever you need them, which is nice. And then we have for one command point, Korgoth's Jest. Use a stratagem when an enemy unit falls back from a Harlequin unit from your army. After the enemy unit finishes moving, provided there are no enemy units within one inch of your unit, you can shoot the enemy unit that fell back as if it were the shooting phase. That's kind of neat. Then we have, for one command point, the Hundred Swords of Veil. Vale. Uh, use a stratagem at the start of your first battle round before the first turn begins. Select one Harlequin unit from your army, remove this unit from the battlefield, and redeploy it anywhere in your uh, deployment zone. If you select a transport, all units embarked inside remain so when redeployed. If both armies have a unit that can redeploy, roll off. The winner chooses which to place first and their units, or sorry, whether to place their units first or second. You can only use a stratagem once per battle. So, nice little counter deploy thing, but for the Harlequins, you move pretty fast as it is, so might not use that. Maybe you will, not totally sure. 
Next up, we have a ability here for one command point, Torments of the Fiery Pit. Use a stratagem in the fight phase before attacking with a Harlequin character from your army that has lost any wounds uh, this battle round. Until the end of the phase, increase the strength characteristic and attack characteristic of that model by one. That's really cool, especially if you put it on things like um, a, shat or sorry, a, a solitaire model staying right there. Uh, if you put on a solitaire, if he doesn't go first and he takes maybe one or two wounds because he's got that three up save to kind of keep him alive, you can spend the one command point and now he's got 10 attacks or if he's blitzed he's got 12 attacks and that means you're now hitting at strength 6 or strength 7 with either the, uh, the Caress or the Harlequin's Kiss which is kind of nice right there. Then you have the Vessel of Fate for one command point. Use a strategy in your Psychic phase. A Shadow Seer from your army can attempt to cast one additional Psychic power this phase. Usually what you're going to use that for is things like Smite because the uh, Shadow Seers, now this is something I messed up actually in a couple of battle reports, but the Shadow Seers already are able to cast two powers, so you're probably going to cast the two powers that they know. If you want to do uh, Fog and Veil or Twilight Pathways and the Mirror of Minds, or you want to throw out the minus one leadership, you want to do stuff like that, you have that available. But it's nice to have this option available to you if you want to throw out a Smite, just throw a little bit extra damage out. Uh, another strategy that we've seen in quite a few armies for three command points, War Dancers. Uh, use a strategy at the end of the fight phase, select a Harlequin's unit from your army that has already fought this phase. That unit can immediately pile in and fight an additional time. Again, three command points, a little bit pricey, but we have seen that before. This is a neat one though, Fire and Fade for one command point. Use a stratagem after a Harlequin unit from your army shoots in the shooting phase. The unit can immediately move seven inches as if it were the movement phase. It cannot advance as part of this move. However, it cannot charge in the same turn that it does so. Kind of a neat little trick, it's very reminiscent of like the jump packs or the jet packs from 7th edition where you would shoot and then you'd get to move an extra little distance there. Uh, you want to use this thing for like your snipers, like a death jester to fire something and if you want to do fire and phage you can put them somewhere that he's out of line of sight you don't have to worry about getting shot back in, in response there. He's a character so he does have plot armor but there's a lot of snipers out there that do ignore that rule so it's nice to have this little option to kind of put you where you need to. Or if you want to get your guys a little bit closer onto an objective, say they were just out of range, you shoot them with some pistols, they're done shooting, now you can move up and get on that objective to contest it, or if you kill what you're shooting at, you can get on the objective to hold it, which is awesome. Then we have here, for one command point, Dramatic Entrance. Use a stratagem at the end of your opponent's charge phase. A Harlequin character from your army that is within six inches of an enemy unit can perform a heroic intervention and move up to six inches when it does so. Pretty neat right there. It's a nice little way to say, like, you know what, I got my guys kind of bunched up, you're trying to charge this way or move this way to prevent me from heroically intervening. I'm going to spend a command point so I got that extra little distance to make sure that I'm in. Uh, Warrior Acrobatics for one command point. Essentially what this does is makes so that you can take a Harlequin Infantry unit and automatically advance them six inches. So you don't have to roll the dice there. For one command point, Shrieking Doom. Here we have a special stratagem just for a Death Jester. Use a stratagem before a Death Jester from your army shoots its Shrieker Cannon or Curtain Fall. Use this weapon's shrieker profile, or sorry, using the weapon's shrieker profile, increase the weapon's strength characteristic by one and its damage characteristic to D3 until the end of the phase. Ooh, so that means those strength six minus one, one damage are gonna go to strength seven minus one D3 damage, or strength six, no AP, one damage to strength six, no AP, D3 damage. Ooh, that's really good. Then we have, uh, uh, Isha's Weeping. One command point. Use this stratagem at the end of the phase. At the end of any phase, select a Harlequin unit from your army that suffered casualties during this phase. Improve that unit's invulnerable save by one to a maximum of three plus until the end of your turn. Pretty good. If you have a bigger unit of troops, you would definitely want to use that. Uh, Mitherless Hatred for one command point. Use this stratagem when a Harlequin unit from your army chooses to fight. Reroll failed hit rolls and failed wound rolls for the attacks of this unit if the target is a Slanesh unit until the end of the enemy until the end of the phase. Nice little throwback there to some lore on how they hate this or hate Slanesh so much. Here we have for one command point the Labyrinth Laughs. Use a stratagem when a webway gate from your army is destroyed, but before you remove the model from the battlefield, immediately set up one Eldari unit from your army that has not yet been deployed from the webway, wholly within three inches of the webway gate and more than one inch away from enemy models. After you've done so, remove the webway gate from the battlefield as normal. That's really cool. It comes in handy when it's just like, oh, if you kill this, I'm going to lose this really important thing that I put in the reserve, but you killed it. All right, I'm going to spend the one command point and put it in there. Awesome. For two command points, lightning fast reactions. Use a strategy when a Harlequin unit from your army is targeted by a ranged or melee weapon. Subtract one from all hit rolls made against that unit until the rest of the, I mean, for the rest of the phase. This is what I did mess up in a couple uh, previous battle reports. I thought it was one command point, not two, um, but there are certain things that corrected it later on that you will see. Then over here we've got Haywire Grenade, one command point. Use a strategy before a Harlequin model from your army throws a plasma grenade at a vehicle unit. 
You can only make one single to hit roll with the grenade, but if it hits, the enemy suffers D3 mortal wounds instead of the normal damage. Very cool right there. Uh, for two command points, no price too steep. Use a stratagem when a Midnight Sorrow character from your army is slain. Before removing the model as a casualty, it can fight as if it were the fight phase. If that character was a solitaire or it was slain by a chaos unit, add one to the strength of its attacks, of it, probably add one to its strength and attacks characteristic when resolving that fight. That's kind of neat right there. Then we have, for one command point, Caprius Reflections, Veiled Path Stratagem. Use a stratagem at the end of your opponent's charge phase. Select a Veiled Path unit from your army. That unit can immediately perform a heroic intervention as if it were a character. Hmm, a couple options right there. For two command points, Malicious Frenzy. Use a stratagem before a Frozen Stars unit from your army fights in the fight phase. Until the end of the fight phase, add one to wound rolls for attacks made by this unit if the target is an enemy infantry, beast, or a bike unit. That's kind of handy right there, especially when you start throwing in things like the uh, kiss and stuff like that. And we have here, for one command point, an example made. Use a stratagem in your shooting phase. Select a Dreaming Shadow character from your army. Until the end of the phase, each successful hit roll made by this model causes two hits. Hit rolls of 6 plus made by this model cause three hits on the target instead. Ooh, that's really cool. Because it's a shooting attack and you have to select a character, it's kind of designed for the Death Jester. But when you add that with the Shrieking Doom stratagem. That means you've got three shots hitting on twos. Every hit is going to be two hits. Every six is going to be three hits. So you're averaging out of three dice five hits. And that also means that the Shrieking Doom is going to make it so that your strength seven minus one D, or sorry, strength seven D3 damage. If you want to do the three shots doing it like that. That's really cool right there. Then we've got uh, Sky Stride for one command point. Soaring Spite Stratagem. Use a stratagem before a Soaring Spite Infantry unit consolidates. Instead of moving towards the nearest enemy model, the unit consolidates up to six inches towards the nearest Soaring Spite transport from your army. If the models in that unit end its move within three inches of the transport, the unit may immediately embark upon it, even if it has, uh, sorry, if it has sufficient capacity remaining, uh, as if it were the movement phase, and can do so even if they disembark from the transport during the same turn. That's really cool. Two more left. We have the Silken Knife for two command points. Use the strategy at the start of the charge phase. Select a Silent Shroud unit from your army. Enemy units cannot overwatch against that unit in this phase. That's kind of cool. And the last one we have here for one command point, Webway Ambush. Use a strategy at the end of your movement phase. Choose a Webway gate from your army. Either two units from the Webway Spar can emerge from that gateway this turn, or one unit can emerge from that gateway this turn, but can be set up wholly within three inches and more than one inch away from enemy models. Very, very cool. So you got quite a few options there. Three pages worth of stratagems. I like it. So now we're going to go from that over to the Warlord traits. So they've done the same thing they've done before where they have six different Warlord traits available to you and then they also have six available for specific uh, masks. So we're going to go over the first ones first. We have Luck of the Laughing God. Reroll hit rolls, wound rolls, and damage rolls of one for your Warlord. It's pretty cool. Fractal Storm, your Warlord has a 3-up and vulnerable save against melee weapons. A Foot in the Future, add 2 inches to your Warlord's move characteristic. In addition, add 1 to the distance your Warlord can move each time it advances, falls back, charges, performs a heroic intervention, piles in, or consolidates. That's pretty cool. Uh, Player of the Light, reroll failed charge rolls for your Warlord and any, any friendly mask units that are within 6 inches of your Warlord. That's pretty cool there, giving you some nice charge distances. Player of the Dark, each wound roll of six made for your Warlord's attacks in the fight phase inflicts one mortal wound in addition to their normal damage. Okay. And then Player of the Twilight, this is the one that I actually really like. Once per battle, oh, sorry, hang on. <coughs> Once per battle, you can reroll a hit roll, wound roll, or save roll made by your Warlord. In addition, if your army is battle forged and your Warlord is on the battlefield, roll a d6 each time your opponent uses a stratagem. If the result exactly matches the number of command points spent to use that stratagem, you gain that many command points. That's super cool. So it's nice, kind of like playing a little mini game where somebody goes, I'm going to spend two command points to not fail that morale check. And you go, okay, well, I'm going to roll a die. I got a two. I get two command points. So it has actually the same odds as uh, the six up get a command point back whenever you use that, or whenever your opponent uses a stratagem on a six, you steal a command point, stuff like that. So it's kind of neat. 
Now we start looking at the actual Mask Warlord traits. We have Midnight Sorrow, so that is the... Hang on, let me jump back so I can refer to this for you guys. Midnight Sorrow is the one that you can uh, move an additional D60 inches when you fall back, and you can consolidate up to 6 inches. Uh, Nemesis of the Damned. Each hit roll of 6 for your Warlord in the fight phase scores 2 hits instead of 1. In addition, add 1 to the hit rolls made by your Warlord against Chaos units. Very cool. Then we have Webway Walker uh, for the Veiled Path. This is the... Uh, you roll two dice and discard the highest when you're in the fight phase and your opponent's match hit roll matches the lower die result, it's an automatic miss. Uh, during deployment, you can set your Warlord up in the webway instead of place them on the battlefield. Your Warlord can emerge at the end of any movement phases, set them up anywhere on the battlefield more than nine inches away from enemy units. Furthermore, you can use the webway assault stratagem twice. Now that's the one where you can, uh, for one command point, put somebody in the deep strike reserve for three command points, you can put two units in. Now that you're able to use it twice, you could, for six command points, put four units into Deep Strike Reserve, which is kind of nice right there. Then for the Frozen Stars, this is the one where you add one to the attack profile if they charge that turn. Our kin shall rise again. Roll a d6 each time a model from the Frozen Stars unit in your armies with the six inches of your Warlord loses its final wound. On a six, that wound is not lost and the model is not slain. This Warlord trait has no effect if it's under the same effect of the Webway Dance Psychic Power. Now the Webway Dance one is the six up, feel no pain, basically. Dreaming Shadow. Oh, did I miss one? No, they just reversed it. Okay, Dreaming Shadow. That is the, uh, you don't fail morale tests, and on a 4 plus you can shoot once, or sorry, shoot or fight again. There's is Warden of the, Dre of the Dead. Uh, add one to any somber sentinels roll made for Dreaming Shadow units from your army while they're within six inches of your warlord. Add two instead whilst there are any Necron units on the battlefield. So that means that now, on, instead of it being on a 4+, plus, you add it on a 3+, plus, you get to fight again, which is kind of cool. Soaring Spite. I like this one. I use this one in the battle against Josh. Sky Strider. Your Warlord can disembark from a transport even after it has moved. And that is the one that allows you to uh, uh, turn all your pistol weapons into assault if they're embarked into a transport. And you also ignore the rule for advancing and shooting assault weapons, which is kind of cool. And then finally, Silent Shroud. This is the... Uh, subtract one from the leadership characteristic and you make and you also make two morale checks. Uh, the final joke, if your warlord is slain in the fight phase, roll a d6. On a 2+, plus, the unit that killed your warlord suffers d3 mortal wounds after it has finished making all its attacks. On a 6, the enemy unit suffers d6 mortal wounds instead. I, get, I like why that's called uh, the final joke, which is kind of cool right there. Alright, finally, the last thing we have here before we, I get into a couple of the little combos that I figured out. We have the Enigmas of the Black Library. These are all their relics. So, we have the Mask of Secrets. This is one that came out in the chapter approved. We've seen it before. The Bearer uh, increased their leadership characteristic by one. In addition, all enemy units reduced their leadership characteristic by one while they're within six inches of the Bearer. So you can then take that relic, tag that on with the uh, minus two leadership from the Death Jester shooting minus another leadership from your spell from the Shadow Seer, minus another leadership from the Mask, and then have them roll two dice taking the highest for the morale check. So you can get your opponent down minus four leadership and then make them take a morale check, which is kind of cool right there. Minus two? Minus four, or sorry, minus five. Wow, that's kind of gross. Yeah, minus five, Ugh. It's tricky, it takes a lot, but you can get them down minus five and then make them roll two dice, so that's kind of nice. Uh, the storied sword, it's, uh, it's basically just a different power weapon. So uh, a model with a power sword can replace their profile with this one. Uh, strength plus one, AP minus three, D3 damage, and you reroll failed hit rolls for this weapon. A uh, little bit weird for that one because... Um, oh no, actually that'd be really cool. Because you could give that to a uh, troop master and they can now reroll their failed hit rolls and they can also reroll their failed wound rolls. So I like that. Uh, the Suit of Hidden Knives. I, I like this one. Roll a d6 each time a hit roll of 1 is made for an enemy model targeting the wearer in the fight phase. On a 2+, plus, that model suffers, sorry, that unit suffers a mortal wound after the unit has resolved all of its attacks. Reason why I think this is really cool is that you can take the Suit of Hidden Knives, put it on, say, a Shadow Seer, have that Shadow Seer know Veil and Fog, have them cast Veil and Fog on a unit, so now the unit is uh, rolling... Uh, a 1 on a 1, 2, or 3, and then once you're in combat, do Lightning Reflexes for two command points, and that means if your opponent ever rolls a 1, 2, 3, or 4 for their to hit roll, you basically get to take those dice, roll them, and every 2 plus is a mortal wound reflected back onto that unit. That's really cool. That's one of the strategies I like to use for them. Next up we have a Crescendo. It's a Shuriken Pistol replacement that has range 12, pistol D6, strength 4, AP nothing, 2 damage, and every wound roll of 6 plus is treated at AP minus 3. So 
it's instead of being a pistol one, it's pistol d6, and instead of doing one damage, it does two. Kind of neat right there. The Star Mist Remnant. The wearer has a three of vulnerable save against ranged weapons. In addition, enemy units cannot fire Overwatch at the wearer during a turn where the wearer advanced. Very cool right there. Throw that on a uh, Solitaire, maybe? Because the Solitaire is allowed to take relics now. That's kind of cool. The Laughing God's Eye. Friendly Harlequin units automatically pass morale text while they're within six inches of the wearer. In addition, roll a d6 each time a Friendly Harlequin unit suffers a mortal wound. Uh, in the psychic phase, while they're within six inches of the wear, on a six, that mortal wound is ignored. That's kind of nice. I like it. Kargoroth's Rose. This is a Harlequin's Kiss replacement, and it makes that it is strength plus one, AP minus one, D3 damage, and you reroll failed wound rolls with this weapon. When attacking infantry, though, the weapon has a damage profile of three instead of D3. Give that to the solitaire and watch him just come up and mess up somebody because he's hitting on twos then with that he would be wounding on probably fours because he's strength four, toughest four for most things uh, but you get to re-roll that so it's going to be a ton of attacks so if you're doing the ten attacks hitting on twos that means you're probably going to get about nine-ish hits uh, out of those nine hits if you're wounding on fours that means you're going to get four and a half that are going to wound but then you get to re-roll four and a half which means that you're going to be getting six and six point seven five hits so let's say seven hits at minus one, three damage apiece against infantry. That's pretty good. Midnight's Chime. Midnight Sorrow model only. Once per battle at the beginning of the fight phase, the bearer can activate Midnight's Chime. Until the end of the phase, all Midnight Sorrow units increase their attack characteristics by one whilst they are within six inches of the bearer. So, yeah, that's kind of cool. Uh, if it's the Midnight Sorrow one, that's not the one I'm thinking of, is it? No, that's the one that they can move an additional D3. Okay. So, yeah, you can get a couple extra attacks in with that. That's kind of neat right there. Uh, we have the Mirror Staff. Veiled Path Shadow Seer only replaces the uh, Bearer's Mist Staff with the following profile. Uh, shooting, Assault D6, Strength, Star, AP minus 1, 1 damage. In melee, uh, Star, Strength, minus 1, D3 damage. The special rule for this one is that its strength doesn't matter. It always wounds equal to whatever the target's ballistic skill is if you're shooting, or what their weapon skill is if you're in close combat. If at any point in time they don't have a ballistic skill or a weapon skill, it's always going to be wounding on a 6. So. Uh, the Ghoul Mask. Frozen Stars model only. The wearer of the Ghoul Mask can attempt to deny one psychic power in each psychic phase, the same as a Psyker. In addition, you add one to the Deny the Witch test for the bearer. Very cool right there. Okay, here we have my favorite relic. Curtainfall. Dreaming Shadow Death Jester only replaces the bearer's Shuriken Cannon with the following profile. It is a Shrieker firing mode, 30 inch range, Assault 1, Strength 7, minus 3, 1 damage. If you go into Shuriken mode, it's 30 inch range, Assault 3, Strength 7, minus 2, 1 damage. The abilities for this. When attacking with this weapon, choose one of the profiles above. Each time you make a wound roll of 6 plus with this weapon, the hit is resolved at AP minus 4. Each time an infantry model is slain by an attack with this weapon, the unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. If any models in this, turn, uh, in this unit are slain by this weapon, subtract two from their leadership characteristic until the end of the turn. This modifier is not cumulative with, the, uh, with that caused by the shirking, Shrieker Cannon. Okay, so let's go through this. If you do the Assault 3, you got three shots, Strength 7, minus two, one damage. Every time you kill an infantry model, you roll D3 mortal wounds that are then inflicted onto that unit. Then what you do is, when you declare that you're gonna shoot, you go ahead and use the stratagem, Shrieking Doom, increasing the strength of the weapon from strength seven to strength eight, and increasing the damage from one to D3. That's pretty good right off the bat, because now strength eight, you're probably gonna be wounding everything on twos anyway. But, we're not done yet. Jump over to, where is it in here? Um, did I lose it? Oh, here we go. An example made. Now, this is for dreaming shadow units only, which you have to be if you want to take curtain fall, which makes it so that in the shooting phase, you select a, a dreaming shadow's character, like a death jester, and every time you roll a hit, it counts as two hits. Every time you roll a six, it counts as three hits. So now, if you got three shots coming from the death jester, that means that's going to equal, on average, five hits. Those five hits are wounding on twos, which means you might mess up one of them. Then you've got a minus two damage, d minus two D3 damage going into a unit. So let's say, for example, it's a four up going up to a six up, they fail all of them, they fail three, whatever. You fail three, three of them die. Then you get to roll three D3 mortal wounds that are also applied onto that unit. The kicker, say for example, you're shooting at Terminators and they got two wounds apiece, this does D3 damage apiece. 
So you get to roll, oh, I got a 66% chance of just killing one of them every single time. So good. Death gestures became so good with that relic. <sighs> okay. It's a little bit more of my happiness right there. Next up we have uh, Falshu's Talon. Soaring spite model only. Now these are the ones that are able to treat the transports. Uh, pistols inside are treated as assault and they don't take a negative for assaulting and firing the assault weapons. Uh, when the wearer is embarked on a soaring spite transport, the vehicle may move an additional six inches in the movement phase. In addition, if a soaring spite transport is destroyed while the wearer is embarked in it, you do not need to roll any dice to see if your disembarking models are slain and the transport does not explode. Hmm. That's pretty handy. And then lastly we have uh, Shindavel's Veil. Silent Shroud, Troopmaster, or Shadowseer only increase the range of all their aura effects by three inches. It's pretty good right there. Okay. So that's going to be it for the review. Let's talk strategies really quick here. So a couple of things that I've learned from the three games that I've played is that you can, uh, you have to make, keep this in mind, the transports are only able to carry the masks that they're like suited with. So that's absolutely fine. But if we start taking things like the Silent Sorrow um, and the one that allows you to move, assault, and still fire your pistols, you take that, you grab a Shadow Seer, Put them in the same bracket, give them the suit of hidden blades, teach them the powers fog and veil, then you take a troop master, give him the talon, put him in the transport with the shadow seer, and then make that shadow seer your warlord with the spite warlord trait, which allows them to get out after a vehicle has finished moving. Now I've done this, and it bothered Josh a little bit. That means you can go ahead and take a transport, move it 28 inches because it's going to go 16 plus six from advancing, plus an additional six inches from the talon that the transport is getting because it's got the troop master inside, going 28 inches. After it's moved that 28 inches, you can take that shadow seer, jump them out three inches, then they move eight inches, and if you want to, you can even advance them an additional D6, so you're going anywhere from another three to whatever. So, so far, we're going 39 inches with a shadow seer. Once they've finished everything, now that's 39 minimum, 40 if you want to start, 40 minimum if you want to advance it as well. Now you've got that 40 inch move. Then what you get to do is take that shadow seer and go, I'm going to veil myself to give me myself minus one. I'm going to fog a unit to give you minus one. Then I'm going to charge said unit. Then in the fight phase, I'm going to spend two command points for lightning reflexes, which means that now that unit is turn one probably engaged in combat with somebody that they don't want to fight, but because of the combat phase, you have to fight them. You can't pull your punches. The least thing you can do is try not to pile in. But that also means that every hit roll of a one, two, three, or four on a two plus is going to reflect back on you and cause a mortal wound. Here's the nice little kicker. Because of that, you can't just forfeit your attacking if you can't hit them. For, say you have a 4 plus to hit, you still have to roll to see how many 5s and 6s you roll to not have them reflect back on you. Yeah, that's really good. Like, really good. Or what you could do is completely kibosh that shadow seer, go ahead and throw a 5-man troop squad in there with fusion pistols, have it go 28 inches up the board, then you've got a 6-inch threat range with those pistols, a 3-inch threat range if you want to double tab with them. That's really good as well. You could throw the Death Jester in there and have him just have a ridiculous threat range because he's going to... Actually, no, you can't throw him in there. Ha! See, this is why I gotta catch myself. Uh, because he has to take the Death Shroud, whichever, mask to get Curtain Fall and access to the uh, Stratagem, he's still really good and able to take out a lot of things. I've actually, in a couple of games, so there's a bit of spoilers coming up here, uh, I had him single-handedly take out a 10-man Death Watch squad um, I had him single-handedly take out a seven-man Death Guard squad. I've had him take out two Death Guard five-man squads, and he obliterates Plague Bearers. So that's really cool right there. Uh, a couple of little tricks that I've been able to find so far is that if you take a bunch of guys with the Harlequin's Kiss, give them the, when they charge again, an extra attack, throw a Troop Master next to them, give that Troop Master the Grand Troop Master. Is that what it's called? It's two command points and it bumps them up so they can give a aura six inches of re-rolling ones. Then give them the aura that their ex aura's ranges are extended by three inches. So now you've got a nine inch bubble with the Troop Master causing a unit of guys with the Harlequin's Kiss, the Harlequin's Caress, whatever you want. When they attack, they're on the charge getting five attacks apiece, so a five-man squad throwing out 25 attacks. Hitting on threes, re-rolling ones, wounding on anywhere from fours to threes depending on what you're wounding, but you also get to re-roll failed wounds. 
So that gets really scary. And then on top of that, they're doing anywhere from minus one to D3 damage to minus two, one damage, but strength five, or minus three, one damage. It all depends on what you want to grab, but still really, really good. And depending on what unit it is, it doesn't matter because you can throw the entire mask under something, give three different units of three different weapons, they can target prioritize whatever they need, and with that nine inch bubble, you can actually probably reach two different units with them, and they're so fast, you can't stop them. Oh, it's so good. Anyway, now that you've heard this review, I would definitely recommend checking out the Battle Report if you haven't checked that out yet. It is myself versus a Death Guard. I had a wonderful guest in by the name of Ken. We had a wonderful game, and I got to show off a number of different tricks, including that webway that I kind of disagree with bringing. It's not that good. I think I verbalized that, but no spoilers. You'll have to see what it does. And I also get to throw out a couple different tricks here and there that I think you guys will really enjoy. So do me a favor in the comment section below. Let me know what you think of this. Quick disclaimer if you're reading this ahead of time. Um, I went through this book, I tried very hard to kind of memorize everything and play my games, reading through it again. I am noticing a few little things that I made mistakes on in my battle reports, and I apologize for that. New book, and I'm trying to bust out three battle reports in like two days, so just after opening the book here. So I'm a little bit rusty, it's a new couple new things that I had to learn and adjust to, but I very much am super happy with this codex, guys. If you are a Harlequin, Harlequins fan or thinking about it, definitely check them out. They are super good right now. Anyone who says they're not competitive, Come on down and let's play a game. We'll see what happens because honestly, I think they are very competitive right now. They have so many tricks, so many answers to a bunch of different things. And the nice thing about Harlequins is that you can just kind of kid out everybody however you need to. They will have an answer for whatever you're going to throw at them. So that's it, guys. Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think of the new Harlequin Codex. Are you going to be starting a new Harlequin Army? Have you started a Harlequin Army and are now super excited because you have one? Do you have a Harlequin Army that you're going to be making some changes to? Possibly buying some Death Jesters? Let me know in the comment section below, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, happy wargaming.